Shyla Curtis, welcome back. I loved your talk at TEDx Sydney yeah. about building the game for women in Australia, but also an opportunity to tackle the culture that we have in this country using one of the greatest change agents we have, the AFL. But one part that you talked about that I would like to explore more is the role that technology played in that and taking, you talked about putting the AFL players on Twitter. I'd love to know more about how you prepared athletes who aren't necessarily au fait with social media to tell their stories best and how to get their message out to the world. Yeah, well, it's really interesting. I spent a month um, at the Ladies Professional Golf Association, which is funny because I'm back in golf now, but I spent a month um, on an exchange program with the US State Department. And um, whilst I was over there, um, I learned what they did with their professional athletes on their tour. And if you know anything about that women's tour, it was set up very similar to the WTA in tennis, but it was set up by women for women according to the needs of women. And they would drive around little towns and in their station wagons and put out little pickets and so on and get, they built this whole tour from 1950s with, through their own blood, sweat and tears. And, and so it's still kind of very much in that vein, even though the, the old PGA is quite powerful and big now, but they still have to really strategically tell their story because in some respect, um, you know, they're kind of overshadowed by the, the male PGA tour. So I learned a lot about what they did with their athletes to get them to tell the story using the vehicle that is Twitter. And they would put in their lockers, just one pages, these are the people you need to tag, these are the, this is a really good hashtag, this is a really good comment, here's a couple of things you could say. And they would put it in their lockers and then change it up. So they would teach their players slowly about how to, I guess, tell the story and, and control the narrative that they wanted out there in the broader community. So then I came home and uh, I was in charge of setting up the under 18 high performance program for AFL Victoria, which is now uh, the TAC Cup, which is an under 18 state league. And, you know, the media didn't want to touch us. They didn't want to touch female football. They didn't want to touch female sport. Now they do, of course, but we needed a way to be able to tell our own story in a way that was important for us or, or actually told our truth. So um, the media always wanted to tell the, the mad, bad and sad story. Um, how many concussions have you had? How many injuries? Can you mark the ball <laughs> in your chest? You know, what did your mum think about you playing? So we, we actually just wanted to create our own story. And so putting the girls on Twitter and, and sort of teaching them the strategies that we could use and how using Twitter as a platform to control how we were portrayed in the broader community. Um, and the kids loved it. I mean, these are 13, 14, 15 year old girls and we're teaching them about the power of social media, but the power of actually having agency through using your voice and the, and the means that you have in your own hands that you can control. And, and they bought into it and, and they're all now, many of them are now playing AFLW and they really understand that vehicle uh, for them, not only to tell the, the wider football story, but now they're professional athletes to tell their own personal story and make sure that their own brand and reputation in the broader community is, uh, is accurate and authentic. You're right. We talked a little bit backstage about how when they posted a picture, you had to kill several birds with one stone in one communication. Can you tell us a bit more about that? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, building AFLW was just an enormous body of work. And it wasn't just the 10 years that I, you know, that I was at AFL Victoria, but there were so many women had gone before me who'd, who'd built, I guess, the, you know, the, sort of the foundations of, of what became the AFLW. And so in that sense, there was just so much work to do. We were coming from such a long way back that I had a bit of a mantra for me that I had to kill three birds with one stone. And, um, and everything we did had to have, it had to be multi-layered and it had to be able to um, convince many of those naysayers. It had to be a piece of evidence and um, to convince those naysayers to come with us in some way, shape or form. And uh, everyone's motivated to do things I guess according to what their own, what their ego says or what's important to them or what and, and sometimes what's important to you and what's important to me are binary opposites. So how can we produce an image on social media that, that, that meets your needs and meets my needs and then both of us actually head, head in the same direction? And that's essentially what we had to do a lot of the time and, and be really strategic with how we how we um, positioned ourselves in that space. And could you tell us about how that moment where you had reached the tipping point and thought, we've made it, you know? what you dreamed of from being five years old has happened. Yeah, well, that was pretty amazing. And, you know, that first night, um, I'm not sure how many of you might have gotten to Carlton Football Ground in Melbourne, but that night, I, I'd just gotten back from the US. I'd, I, I went to the inauguration of Donald Trump and um, awesome. I booked my tickets before the election. Um, <laughs> and 
Um, so I made sure I went to the Women's March the next day. So I'd been in this kind of, <laughs> sort of balanced it out a little bit, which was nice. But I'd spent six weeks in the US and I, my dad, uh, for those who saw my TEDx uh, Sydney talk, my dad's from Turkey, he's a Muslim man, not super practicing. Eats a lot of bacon and drinks a lot of beer for that. But <laughs> I was concerned because I flew out of the US into Canada the day that the immigration ban happened. Mm. And so I was really stressed uh, about what that might mean for me to get back into the US at that time to then get on my plane to fly home to go to that first AFLW game. I had to call it for ABC Radio and I did not want to miss that. But I was really stressed and it was a pretty tough time. In the, I mean, it still is a pretty tough time over there, but it was pretty tense. Mm. And so I've flown home from this place of fear and stress and tension and the very next day, I f you know, I fly into Melbourne and the next day we get AFLW and some friends, uh, we have a drink in a bar in Sydney Road in Brunswick, and as we come down Sydney Road, we're met with these trams that are coming up from the city, from the CBD, with people spilling out of these trams. And these people, we hit Princes Park, which is enormous, it's, it's two miles around, and people were just flowing in into the grass and the sun, we couldn't have better, had a better picture really, the sun was orange and purple in the sky, and you know, kids and footies and scarves, and it was just absolutely magnificent. And as I was walking into the ground, it was, there was very much uh, an, an awareness for me that everything we thought was going to happen was happening, was happening. And a lot of people have said to me, were you surprised by that lockout match? And absolutely I wasn't because there is no one that's been involved in the women's game prior to AFLW um, that has ever doubted the power and potential of that game and, and of what it could achieve. We know 100 years ago in 1896, girls from Presbyterian Ladies College were quoted in the Argus as saying, you know, those boys look like they're having a lot of fun out there. We would like to have fun too, you know, that looks like a great game to play. So 100 years ago, girls were asking for this. In their corsets and petticoats. Absolutely and... they were. So, you know, it, was ju it just made sense that there was, as I talked about, a tsunami of girls just outside that door waiting for their invitation to let in, to be let in. And, you know, even my own personal journey, and I, you know, I wouldn't have played the game had I not received an invitation from a friend. I spent a whole year watching my best friend play, and um, I never played a game because I was waiting for an invitation, because the world told me that sport is a place, as a woman and a girl, that you ask for an invitation. And so I spent a whole year missing out on playing. I wish I'd had an extra 14 games on my, on my games tally now, but, you know, we just opened that door a, a, in so many ways for so many people and it was, you know, that, that, that idea of waiting for an invitation, you know, we sort of smashed that out of the park and it was pretty powerful. But that idea of this is now your rightful place in the world, girls and women, come and take it, come and take it up. And it was so incredibly powerful and it was a really, you know, wonderful night in Melbourne. And Melbourne finally turned the weather on for us too, which is always good, which is always a good thing. <laughs> That's handy. Online co connectivity that we're talking about tonight, you know, with the theme of everything is connected, but also I mean, Australians everywhere love to go and see live sport. Can, so can you talk about the difference there? You know, what does it mean to get in a, in a stadium, thousands of people, and, and connect with people that way? Yeah, I mean, the, the players from that first night talk about what that feeling was like. I mean, that, that stadium was full. People climbing over fences, and they were sitting in the stairwells, and, you know, there was no water to it at all, really. But there was this collective feeling of, you know, wow, we didn't know what, that we needed this. And, what you actually saw at the end of the game was Carlton versus Collingwood, two of the game's most iconic clubs, head to head. Collingwood had lost. You know, they never, you know, they hate losing. They're such an iconic club. But you know what happens? Normally the siren goes and the losing team leaves and the winning team stays. Everyone sings their song and they clap their hands and the players go around. No one left the stadium when that final <laughs> siren went. And I went down on the field and I was interviewing some players, but the Collingwood cheer squad gave their team a standing ovation. No one left that stadium for an hour afterwards. And it was pretty amazing that everyone collectively in Melbourne that night had this experience together. And, and, and even now you talk about it and people say, oh, that first night, and you go, did you get in? And everyone, oh no, I missed out. Oh, I'm so sorry you got locked out. You either got locked out or you were locked in. So, um, and so there is this sort of myth that, or this mythology that's now coming out around this game that we're all connected by whether or not you got in or you got out, you were stuck outside. So um, it was one of the most beautiful collective efforts I've ever experienced because we all were on a, we were all kicking down that door together and I, you know, I don't know, maybe it's, there's a, 
maybe what it might have felt like, uh, you know, when the Berlin Wall came down, that they pushed it down with their own hands, and we almost did the same thing that night, that this was something that the people had asked for, and the kids had always, you know, there's always that idea of if you build it, they'll come, and I, I would say to the girls, well, actually, if you come, they're going to have to build it, and the girls absolutely did come, their parents came, the media came in the end, um, the community football leagues, the coaches, the clubs, they all came, and then in the end, the AFL had no choice but to build it. And you know, we've got a terrific product, and uh, we've got a great team up in here in Sydney, the GWS Giants. And um, the competition's growing, and we're about to roll into the third season come February. So um, it's a pretty exciting time for a woman uh, or a girl to be uh, interested in playing in, in playing footy. Fantastic. And look, finally, an athlete's job is to play sport, and now you're working with golf rather than the AFL. What do you think the future is, and the shifts we need to make to? for sports people in, in social media and using technology? It's a really good question and really understanding the power of you know, your privilege and your platform. And, you know, sport pervades the national conversation. And with that, if you have such access to the minds and hearts of the broader community and also the leadership structures in our society, you've got a responsibility with that. And I think athletes need to understand that as well. And I certainly know our female players within the AFL system and golf as well. They really have a passion for making sure they leave a legacy where the game is better than when they found it. And they make sure that the opportunities continue to grow for girls and women. And they really buy into that. In fact, there's some really good research around um, the sense of responsibility that female athletes feel around producing something greater than what they've currently got for themselves. And that's quite a different thing from male athletes. So the girls really and the women really understand the, their platform, they understand the privilege around that, but certainly I think sport's got to understand its privilege uh, in, in, in influencing the national conversation. Uh, and I think that in lots of ways sport has kept Door, many doors closed for many different people across time, and it's been the problem. Sport's been a really big contributor to the problem. Sport now has the opportunity to be the solution and, and correct and, and make changes um, because it has so much power in the national conversation. So um, that's probably the, the thing that I'm in golf for because I, that, that's why I work in sport because it, it does influence the national conversation. Um, golf's a global sport. It's a truly global sport, so it's a great opportunity for me to, to be able to keep this dialogue going and make sure that Australia is a leader in the gender equality space, not, not a hindrance or a problem. Keep the dialogue going. Well, everyone, thanks, Charlotte Curtis, very much. Thank you. Thanks so much. Thank you.